Good evening. This is CTV News for Friday, November 4th. I'm Byron Scott. And I'm Patricia Ballone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Well, a team from the Centers for Disease Control is brought in to help Prince George's Hospital investigate a lingering bacterium problem. Uh, Rochelle Metzger is just back from Chevrolet where officials outline the latest developments. Rochelle? That's right. This is a team effort between state, federal, and local officials to determine the cause of this outbreak. Now, experts from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, as well as the University of Maryland School of Medicine, are at the Chevrolet facility to help identify the source of the latest outbreak in the neonatal intensive care unit. Now, this is the second time in several months that infants at Prince George's Hospital Center have te tested positive for Pseudomonas, a potentially deadly bacteria. This time, officials say they're puzzled because in August, when the bacterium was first discovered, it was traced to the water system plumbing. Recent samples tested negative. Experts explain the latest efforts to find the cause. We have now a recurrence of Pseudomonas in our babies, in our NICU, in the absence of Pseudomonas in the water to the NICU. So the entire team is puzzled and wondering what next could be the source? So what that CDC team brings, as I mentioned, a physician, a pediatrician expert from CDC, a laboratory expert to arrive, a nurse infection control preventionist, and an environmentally focused industrial hygiene epidemiologist. They bring this intense focus that says, we thought we knew the cause and we treated, but we need to look back and, and consider other possible causes. This summer, my team was asked to review deaths, recent deaths at Prince George's Hospital Center NICU, and to provide independent peer case review on whether any of those cases could be linked to Pseudomonas. There have been seven deaths of NICU babies here since January 2016. Three were immediately ruled out as not connected to Pseudomonas. Therefore, my colleagues looked at four potentially relevant infant death cases. There is agreement among a number of experts um, that among those four deaths, two could not be connected to Pseudomonas. After extensive chart review conducted to date, while there is a likelihood, it remains unclear whether Pseudomonas can be conclusively linked to the two other infant deaths. On October 27th, once again, cultures taken from two NICU babies showed the bacteria in their systems. That's when the hospital closed the, closed the neonatal unit and transferred five patients elsewhere. Now, sources for Pseudomonas are environmental. So in addition to treatment of the water system, uh, they've been doing another other of other things since August mm -hmm. to combat uh, this issue. And they're hoping that the steps that they've taken uh, will help prevent spread of this until they determine the cause for this latest outbreak. And those include uh, top to bottom equipment disinfection, surface disinfection. They've changed their scrubbing practices mm -hmm. for employees. They've got brought in better soap, they say, more alcohol sanitizer in use. So uh, they're trying to make sure that the environment for these patients uh, are as clean as possible, but they're baffled to, as to where this came from. All right, we'll be hearing much more about this soon. Thank you, Rochelle. And early voting is over in Maryland, and the number of voters who turned out is big, huge. More than 859,000 people exercised their right to early vote. That's nearly double the tally four years ago. Prince George's also saw a spike in the numbers. Here in Prince George's County, we had more than 155,000 voters to come out to vote early during the eight-day period. There were no issues. We had lines, of course, um, the last day of early voting and the first day of early voting. We had long lines with a large number of voters who just turned out, um, particularly in closing hours. But that was to be expected because a lot of people wait until the last day to vote. Also, CTV News will have a special election night -like coverage on Tuesday after the polls close. Well, ca county officials are, excuse me, rather, uh, non-U.S. citizens in Hyattsville could soon have the right to vote in city elections under a current proposal. The local council held a contentious public hearing last week on the issue after nearly a year of working on, the, on this measure. The bill originally contained a 14-day residency requirement, but sponsors of the proposal say they will amend it to 30 days. 
I think that non-citizens in our city, and we're talking about municipal elections, we're not talking about federal policy or foreign policy, we're not talking about statewide policy, uh, we're talking about things like trash collection and police services, and I think that residents who live in our city that are directly impacted by those things ought to have a voice in electing the city's leadership. Ruth Ann Frazier is one of two council members opposed to the bill. They started out by saying they pay taxes. Well, if you've only lived in the city for 14 or 30 days, how much taxes have you paid? And I know it's going to pay us. They have the votes, and I'm sad. Tacoma Park passed a similar law back in 1992, and since then, five other Maryland municipalities have done the same all in Montgomery County. Hyattsville Council members will be voting on the measure next Monday evening at 8, and by law, the city must vote a second time on the issue two weeks after. If passed, the law would go into effect before Hyattsville elections in May 2017. And you are watching CTV News. I'm Patricia Vallone. And I'm Byron Scott. Up next